Um, the one thing though that I'm discovering is, is that it's very time consuming because there are some, the records at times feel very large and unwieldy and if you're trying to get results they can be kind of complicated. Um, so I'm just showing you the map, the Ordnance Survey map, um, which um, you can get from the Public Records Office um, for, um, for your area, for your townland um, and, uh, and things. But as you can see, um, it's still not particularly user friendly at this scale. And so one of the things that's been really plaguing me over the last while is how to like use and manipulate maps. And I've been really struggling with this. Okay, because eventually, again, you can't see anything, you can't read any of the detail there. Um, and um, you can go onto the web, on the internet, the Ordnance Survey has actually published the first edition maps um, for, uh, for Ireland. And you can zoom in, but it gets a bit grainy on the screen. So I thought, oh, so, you know, and then, and then trying to print one out so you could actually draw on it or do your own little things, that's really hard too. So I just wanted to show you what I was doing this morning, which was cutting and pasting, because I got my printer to print it out as a poster, right? But it comes in nine separate A4 pages, and then you get to glue them together. Right? Or you could get Prony to, I think, give you a paper version instead of a digital version, right? Which might actually be the best thing. So I haven't actually found that out yet. So I have to say that I've been kind of struggling a little bit with my maps. And I, and I found that to be um, quite time consuming, more so than I would have liked. Because, um, let me see here if I have, oh, I know where it is. Um, because I have, what I've done is um, I actually kind of drew my own, in essence, in the end, and just added in all my own wee bits to it. And so it looks kind of cack-handed, um, but it kind of has all the bits on it that I need and, uh, and things, and so it actually hasn't worked out too badly. I've also been kind of struggling with actually how to find um, uh, maps, um, but if you're ever interested in the results and the outcomes of my journey, which I hope will enlighten everyone, is, is that I've stuck them up onto the web, um, uh, up onto my blog, um, because much like Irish um, road signs, which will take you almost all the way there, except for the last turn off, where there will be nothing, right? No offense to anyone who heard from Crony, but the, the way to get to your specific map kind of works that way too in that if you're trying to browse to find a map using their online catalog, you can drill down through the pages, but then when you need to find your sheet number, there's no identifier there, so it just says sheet 40, and there's no name, so you're not sure which one is yours, um, and things. And not only that, for example, but if you're working on another set of maps, the Ordnance Survey 25-inch county series, right? Um, which, in short, is, is that for every one of these, there are 16, okay, of the 25 inch series. So it's far more detailed. Um, and it came out in the 1880s. Um, and these maps date from the 1840s. And so um, trying to find the right sheet number. I did it this today with the search room staff. <laughs> and I said, pretend that I've never done this before. And he was great, he was really lovely. So the search room staff are fantastic. But ultimately, that's just something that's just not out there in the general public. And I really floundered around quite a bit. So if you're gonna, if you want a bit of a leg up in the whole map finding world, then by all means, um, hit the blog at some stage. Um, so that kind of preoccupied quite a bit of the month. Um, and it's amazing how you just disappear down inside these things. Um, the other thing that I did was to explore the Ordnance Survey memoirs. Now again, when the Ordnance Survey maps were designed in the 18, were being mapped in the 1840s, the engineers who were in charge of the whole project were, you know, in the British Army, and um, but they were fascinated by the Irish topography, by the landscape, by the place names that things had, and so Thomas Colby decided that um, to accompany each one of these maps, there should be what he called an aid memoir which is how we now get the word Ordnance Survey Memoirs. Because the aid memoirs were meant to be um, uh, explanations 
okay? Big bubbles that would just appear next to a name on the map. They were there to try and illustrate the landscape in a way that a map never could. And so what they did was they, they just basically went around the parish and just talked to local people about where names had come from, how long that building had been there, what were the traditional customs and practices regarding bog land and grazing rights and common edges, um, uh, you know, what was the relationship with the Anglican Church, did they have land in the parish, and all these sorts of questions. They were fascinated by things like antiquities, um, and so on and so forth. And so I read the Ordnance Survey memoir, um, and luckily, um, although the project was axed because it got too expensive and bogged down in detail, luckily enough, for most of the parishes in the north of Ireland, there is um, an extant memoir. And handily enough as well, they've actually even then been published. And what was fascinating to me was the fact that as I read the memoir, I could see the landscape as it was in Kilwater today. Um, and, you know, the memoirists describe the landscape and the prominent features of the landscape, and I could actually recognize and identify. In particular, in Kilwater, there is um, this very large, and again, I'm sorry it's so dark. Let me see if I can just zoom it up a little bit more. Um, now, over here then, on the far right-hand side of the photograph is Agnews Hill, which has a very distinctive um, basalt uh, escarpment, which the engineers tell me is about 150 feet high, um, which runs right along the one side of the mountain. And um, it's, you know, obviously it's still there, right? But um, what's fascinating is, is that it's so distinctive um, and it just, and it still leaps out of the landscape today. And it helps to situate, I think, and to give you a notion of, um, of what Killwater is like and the sort of the continuity of the landscape. But of course, what also is true is, is that the, um, the Ordnance Survey memoirists clearly um, <laughs> felt that Killwater was a place of spectacular beauty, which I hope some of these photographs might show a wee bit anyway. Um, where nothing actually really ever happens, okay? Um, and I just happened to be there on, you know, the one sunny day we had in October. Um, uh, and so as I've said, um, uh, the, um, the memoirists felt that, you know, that nothing really happened. Um, they said it had, Kilwater had neither town, village, public building, nor place of worship. It had no magistrate or police. There was no illicit distilling or smuggling that they could find. No one had emigrated. There was no particular incidence of early marriage, which was something that memoirists and other commentators noticed about pre-famine Ireland. Everyone seemed reasonably healthy. Um, there has not been anything, said one memoirist, that could be said to have produced any improvement in the habits, uh, comforts, or circumstances of the inhabitants of this parish. Um, when you looked at poor relief, the local landlord had donated five pounds to be used as a endowment for the poor. And every year the interest would be donated to the poor. And that was it. There had been nothing else done to sort of alleviate poverty um, in the area. Now the people were described in relatively positive terms um, as being active and shrewd of sober dispositions and industrious habits. But it was remarked over and over again, they don't do anything remarkable. They don't have any customs, they don't have any traditions. Um, they were little given to amusements. And you can see the memoirs saying, they used to dance, some of them, but they don't anymore, not even that. And it was like he was really disappointed, you know, that there wasn't, you know, there wasn't even a dance that anybody in Kilwater did, you know? And now anybody who's from there will know that dancing would be the last thing on a Presbyterian's mind um, in, uh, in the 1830s. Um, but what's really very interesting is, is that, you know, these memoirs are, uh, uh, you know, to a certain extent, extent, reflecting the changes in popular leisure patterns um, that many people are, um, that was taking place at this time. And so the memoirs have been fascinating because just like Barry found with his railway records, the, the number of leads that I was able to get um, reflect are, were, you know, were enormous. 
So for example, although the memoirs claimed over and over again that nothing ever happened, they did list a murder in, that had happened. So this is, again, sort of just to um, indicate that. Um, so in August, uh, in April 1839, Mary McGregor was murdered near Glebe House. And again, the memoirs say that four men were responsible and one had been arrested in Scotland and was now awaiting trial in Carrickfergus Jail. So again, a classic little vignette that you can chase up in the, um, in the, uh, the court records. What happened? I want to know how did they find him in Scotland? You know, um, given the uh, no mobile phones or CCTV footage or anything like that, you know? So hopefully we'll be able to find out and I'll be able to report back before the end. Um, the other thing obviously is the, is the presence of Kilwater Castle, which so dominates the landscape there. Um, and again, the memoirs had quite a lot to say about the Agnew family, who are the local landlords. And the Agnews, I think, are all very, very interesting um, because in the 1830s, the um, estate had passed into the hands of Margaret Jones, who's single. And again, she pops up all the time in the memoirs. So she's clearly very resident, very, very active. She insists that all of the tenants lease directly from her. She won't have any middlemen. And um, so you can see that she's got particular ideas about how her estate ought to be run which aren't necessarily the same as other landlords, which might perhaps give the relationship between the landlords and tenants in the Kilwater area a sort of a distinctive character. So again, I'm hoping that, that that's gonna be something to explore, and I'm gonna come back to Kilwater Castle in a second. Um, the other thing, obviously, is, is that the memoirists mention the uh, local industry in Kilwater, and I don't wanna go into too much detail about that, but just to say that in one of the townlands, um, the map reveals that there are cotton factories, um, but that they are now idle. That, um, and so what, hap what it appears to have been the case is, is that there seems to have been, in the townland of Drumnahoe, a, um, uh, a bleach mill that was built in the 1780s. And it had been taken over for a variety of, um, for a variety of things. Um, and for a variety of industries, um, and cotton had been like the last one that was in there. Mm -hmm. And again, what's really fascinating is, is that if you bear with me and close your eyes, if you've, you know, if you're susceptible to fits of epileptic seizures or anything, um, is to say that, and again, my apologies for it being so dark, is that this is Drumnahoe today with a closed factory. I'm assuming on the same site. So what you've got here really is um, an industrial site in really a very, very rural area that has been off and on occupied and, ocu and employing people since the 1780s, um, which I think is really interesting, okay, because what you can also see, and again, a little bit, is, is that that large sort of square thing in the back is the factory. And on the right, you have the modern council houses for the Millbrook village, um, which is no doubt a replacement for all the workers' cottages that would have been around there. And what you can't really see, but on the left-hand side, is farmers' fields, because this is the country. Okay, and so again, to our modern eyes, to have a factory in the middle of the country just doesn't seem to make much sense. But clearly, this has been an industrial site for a very long time. In the 19th century, it was because of the streams running down off the sides of the glens, you know, um, and things. So again, that's something that I'm hoping to explore in a little bit um, more detail um, later on.